Welcome to another presentation about the Carolina bays, or not. There's enough controversy about the origin of these pockmarks in Ohio that they could be karst depressions made by melting permafrost, or they could be kettles made by isolated ice boulders that melted and left a hole in the ground. But there is a more esoteric possibility that they are craters made by impacts of glacier ice boulders launched by an extraterrestrial impact on an ice sheet. And there are victims to prove it. One of these pits contained the skeleton of a mastodon that was so terribly mangled that only the impact of one of these ice boulders can explain it. About 4.8 kilometers or 3 miles north of Peebles, Ohio, there are several mesas with very distinctive pockmarks. The tops of the mesas are 267 meters above sea level and the adjacent Ohio Brush Creek is 70 meters lower at 197 meters above sea level. Crooked Creek to the east has an elevation of 210 meters above sea level. Zooming in on one of the mesas, I noticed that it was very blurry, as if out of focus. However, the satellite image was very clear and showed a house and another building. I put a Google Earth place marker on the house and switched back to the LiDAR image. The LiDAR did not show the house or the other details that could be seen in the satellite view. This was a really bad LiDAR image. I was concerned about the bad LiDAR image and I contacted Michael Davies. Hello Michael, I hope that you have been well. Chris Cottrell found some very interesting terraces in Ohio, but the LiDAR is blurry, blah blah blah. Michael replied, blurry, huh? This particular area has only 3 meter resolution data set from 20 years ago. About 70% of Ohio has been flown by the USGS for depth quality data, but this area has not been done yet. Besides, the biggest dimples here are only about 30 meters across. At 3 meters resolution, that's a mere 10 data points along any given line. My educated take is that these are car spits, not Carolina Bays. Kind regards, Michael. I told Michael about the analysis of the Indiana pockmarks by Dave Swanson, who found that the cross-section of the cavities is asymmetrical, which is not something typical of cars or kettles. Karst, kettles, and craters are all holes in the ground, but they have different origins and different shapes. Karst holes are created when underground carbonate rock is dissolved by rain, creating underground caves that later collapse. Thermokarst holes are formed when frozen ground or permafrost melts. Since ice has a larger volume than water, the ground shrinks and collapses to form a hole that fills with water. Kettles are formed when dead ice, which is ice isolated from a retreating glacier, sinks into the ground and then melts forming a kettle hole that may or may not fill with water. An oblique impact crater is an inclined penetration funnel that has an asymmetrical shape that depends on the angle of impact. When you have lemons, you make lemonade. I wanted to test whether the Ohio basins were also asymmetrical. I drew a transect through the center of the basin with an azimuth of 177 degrees oriented towards Saginaw Bay. The data that Google Earth uses for drawing the transects appears to have 1 meter resolution and it is independent of the low quality LiDAR image data. The basin has a width of 45 meters and a length of 51 meters which corresponds to an impact angle of 62 degrees. Even though this basin is very shallow, the inclination of the sides is asymmetrical as would be expected for an oblique impact. Assuming that this basin was made by the impact of a piece of glacier ice ejected by an extraterrestrial impact at Saginaw Bay, the ballistic equations indicate that an ice boulder measuring 10 meters in diameter launched at 62 degrees would have a speed of 2.5 kilometers per second and achieve a maximum height of 249 kilometers. This is well above the 100 kilometer limit of Earth's atmosphere. The energy of the impact would be equivalent to about 382 tons of TNT. This is very small compared to the Carolina Bays in the Atlantic coastal plain. However, getting hit by a chunk of ice the size of your living room coming at 2.5 kilometers per second can be lethal, which brings us to the main topic of this presentation. In 1952, Edward S. Thomas reported finding the skeleton of a mastodon at Orleton Farms. In November 1949, some workmen at Orlington Farms, Madison County, Ohio, were probing with an iron rod to locate a plug drain tile. Striking a hard object, they made an excavation, finding instead of a tile, a large mammal bone. The manager of the farm, Mr. W. G. Putnam, notified members of the staff of the Ohio State Museum, who identified the specimen as that of the mastodon Mammoth Americanum. Arrangements were made to excavate the site. The description of the Orleton Farms mastodon shows that it suffered a violent death. The caption of the figure says that the femur has been broken square across. 
The report says, The skeleton proved to be badly disturbed and the bones crushed and broken. As an example of the amount of disturbance, one of the ribs lay beneath one of the tusks, while another was thrust through an aperture in the pelvis. A shoulder blade rested to the right of the skull, and one of the large neck vertebrae was found about 10 feet from the skull near a portion of the pelvis. In spite of the wide dislocation of the parts, the bones of one of the feet remained intact and in place, very possibly in the spot where the animal last stepped. Was the Orleton Farms mastodon hit by a large ice boulder at seven times the speed of sound? Only a forensic pathologist could explain how one of the ribs lay beneath one of the tusks while another was thrust through an aperture in the pelvis, and how one of the large neck vertebrae was found about 10 feet from the skull near a portion of the pelvis. We can imagine that the impact of an ice boulder to the shoulder of the mastodon dislodged the neck vertebra and pushed it along with the rib toward the pelvis while leaving the feet in place due to inertia. It was a quick death. A typical mastodon was about 9 feet tall and 25 feet long. This image illustrates a mastodon being hit by a 4-foot ice boulder. Orleton Farms is located in Madison County, west of the intersection of SR-29 and SR-38, south of the rosedale Milford Center Road, and west of the village of Plumwood. This farm measures approximately 5,200 acres. The LiDAR image of the same area does not have any of the pockmarks that we saw on the mesas near Peebles, Ohio. The texture of the terrain is bumpy and looks as if water flowed through this area in the past. The bumpy or hummocky terrain consists of stony debris called moraines deposited by receding glaciers. Water from the melting glaciers flowed across Orlington Farms toward the Little Derby Creek. The Ohio Journal of Science also had a paper by Richard P. Goldthwaite titled Geological Situation of the Orlington Farms Mastodon. This is an account of the glacial deposits and the layers representing post-glacial time. Most of the field study was made in 1949, prior to the discovery of the Mastodon, as part of a continuing superficial survey by the Water Division of the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and the Groundwater Division of the U.S. Geological Survey. The bones were found in a depression on Orlington Farms on the northeast part of Summerford Township, Madison County. The pit lies about 500 feet north of State Highway 29, two-thirds of the way from West Jefferson to Mechanicsburg. All the bones lay from 16 to 26 inches below the surface. Most of them lay in the upper part of a 22-inch thick gray clay layer. Upper parts of large bones projected well up into a black muck layer 13 inches thick and just under the plow-turned surface. These two layers, black muck above and gray marl below, rest directly upon glacial till. Figure 1 shows the location of the mastodon and the end moraines of central Ohio. Solid lines are the crest of the moraines, and the stippled areas have hummocky moraine topography. The paper does not provide the coordinates of the mastodon site. The location is identified with an asterisk and an arrow between the cities of Mechanicsburg and West Jefferson. In order to find the coordinates of the mastodon site, I marked the location of Mechanicsburg and West Jefferson on a LiDAR image. By overlapping the map by Goldthwaite to match the cities, I was able to get the approximate coordinates of the mastodon site. Goldthwaite proposes that this area was uncovered as carry ice withdrew less than 17,000 years ago. The uncovering by the ice sheet came at the conclusion of a long period of repeated halts in the recession of the ice edge because the mastodon site lies on the northeast side edge of a nested series of end moraines illustrated in figure 1. Figure 2 shows a cross-section of west edge of the kettle hole in which excavation for the mastodon was made based upon soil auger test holes. Goldthwaite says, the hollow in which the bones were found appears to be a glacial kettle hole. The bottom four, or seven before filling, feet of the depression was completely undrained and rolling uplands of till still rise 15 to 30 feet higher on three sides. Dozens of similar depressions may be found nearby. The dissolving away of carbonates did not produce these hollows because the bedrock is buried 80 feet down and is not sufficiently soluble to produce good sinkholes. Goldthwaite says that the hollow where the bones were found appears to be a kettle hole. This kind of hole forms after an isolated piece of ice from a glacier sinks into the ground and eventually melts. However, Goldthwaite rules out karst because the bedrock is too deep and not sufficiently soluble to produce sinkholes. Goldthwaite continues, 
Since dozens of similar hollows are found in a zone all along the east edge of the indistinct northeasterly end moraine, they must be the products of glacial deposition. We know that the ice margin oscillated extensively, for there are wide areas near London of ice laid till over sands previously deposited by meltwater. It is easy to suppose that when the broad fringes of the ice sheet melted thin, the last scraps in one marginal zone were dirt-littered lenses of dead ice. A minor advising pulse of the active ice lobe may have deposited more till over these buried masses. Long after the edge of the moving ice lobe retreated to the north, the buried ice melted out, leaving kettle holes. Under periglacial conditions, these dirt-protected ice masses may have lasted for centuries. Goldthwaite mentions that dozens of similar hollows are found in a zone along the east edge of the moraine. It is good to have geological confirmation of a large number of hollows or pockmarks which are not visible on LIDAR due to the low resolution of the data. Goldthwaite says that it is easy to suppose that the dozens of hollows were formed by lenses of dead ice that formed kettles. However, the story about the advancing pulses of active ice lobes leaving lenses of ice does not hold up when considering the hollows on top of the terraces in southern Ohio which are 60 to 70 meters above the surrounding landscape. Any glacier advances would be in the lower part of the terrain and would be unlikely to reach the top of the mesas and leave ice lenses. Goldthwait asks, how recent are these layers in which the bones are embedded? Certainly it took several centuries to develop the swamp muck on top. Dr. P.B. Sears and Catherine Clisby, 1951, find pine and spruce to be the most abundant pollen in the lower clay. The maximum abundance of such pollen clearly predates the first mixed deciduous forest of warmer postglacial time, 6,000 years ago, and probably before pine time, 6,000 to 9,000 years ago. It is usually associated with the last ice retreat, namely the Mankato, Sears 1941, Flint and Divi 1951. The radiocarbon dating, reported in the preceding article by Dr. Thomas, suggests that wood in the lower part of this smoke layer is 8,420 plus or minus 400 years old. Thus, we may conclude that the open pool condition resulting in the great clay lasted from about 15,000 to about 9,000 years ago. Very interesting. This is a time of the extinction of the North American megafauna. I found more information about Orlington Farms. On January 9, 2007, Orlington Farms LLC of Maumee, Ohio, submitted a permit application for a dairy facility housing 5,428 cows to the Ohio Department of Agriculture's Livestock Environmental Permitting Program. If approved to operate, this facility would be one of the largest dairies in the state of Ohio. The Darby Creek Association was very concerned about the potential damage to the Little Darby Creek and Spring Fork from this proposed facility and encouraged people to support the protection of the creek. Apparently, the efforts to stop the dairy farm were successful. The next time that Orlerton Farms made the news was on December 24, 2009, with the headline, Microsoft co-founder bought the farm? The story said that when a 5,300-acre farm was sold at auction, its Madison County neighbors were happy that it would not become the home of Ohio's largest dairy. Now they are wondering whether the company that paid $27.1 million for the large farm is owned by Bill Gates, Microsoft's chairman and the world's wealthiest man. Orleton Farms was again in the news on January 27, 2023, with a heading, Ohio Regulators Set Public Hearing for Proposed Solar Farm on Bill Gates' Property. The Ohio Power Siting Board, the state agency that oversees new sources of power generation in the state, has set a hearing for 5 p.m. on April 11 at Jonathan Alder High School in Plain City to allow people to testify about the proposed Oak Run Solar Project. The project would consist of solar panel arrays and associated facilities on about 4,400 acres across a 6,050-acre project area. Construction could start before the end of 2023, and the solar farm would come online in chunks, beginning potentially as soon as the end of 2025, according to the siting board documents. I was concerned that the Oak Run Solar Farm would destroy the site where the mastodon was found, so I submitted a comment to the Ohio Public Utilities Commission asking them to protect the site for future research. Mastodons probably traveled in family groups like the elephants of today. Perhaps new discoveries will be made during the construction of the Oak Run Solar Farm. 
The most significant finding of the papers by Edward Thomas and Richard Goldthwaite is the association of a badly traumatized mastodon skeleton within sediments dating to the time of the Younger Dryas Cataclysm 12,900 years ago. The damage shown by the skeleton is so extreme that it is plausible to conclude that the mastodon was hit by a chunk of ice during the ballistic sedimentation of ice boulders that created the Carolina base. The Orlerton Farms Mastodon gives us a clue that the megafauna did not become extinct from overhunting by Native Americans or from climate conditions, but that their demise originated from the secondary impacts of the ejecta from an extraterrestrial impact on the ice sheet that covered North America. Thank you for joining me in the investigation of the Carolina Bays and the Younger Dryas Cataclysm. The Carolina Bays should not be neglected. Ask your geology professors to discuss the Carolina Bays because they are the most prevalent geological structures in the Atlantic coastal plain. There is a link to the LiDAR visualization tool in the description of the video. My book about the Carolina Bays is available at Amazon. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel to be notified of future videos about the Carolina Bays and other scientific topics.